Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. Today, I have the great honor of speaking with Ferdinand Metz, instrumental in establishing the Chef's Apprenticeship Certification, Master Chef Certification programs in the United States. Notably, he led the United States Culinary Olympic team to an unprecedented three consecutive world championships over a remarkable 20-year span. Metz's illustrious career includes a four-year tenure as the president of the American Culinary Federation, where he left an indelible mark. He holds the distinction of being the first certified master chef, coupled with a rare achievement of earning a master's degree in business administration. During his 21-year tenure as president of the Culinary Institute of America, Ferdinand Metz witnessed the graduation of over 30,000 students. He's also been honored with nearly every major award in the culinary world, including the Lifetime Achievement Award and induction into the esteemed Who's Who in Cooking by the James Beard Foundation. Metz's contributions have been recognized internationally with distinctions such as the Medal of the French Republic and the Esteem Maitre d'Honneur, titled by the Chaine de Retisseur, where he stands as one of only three recipients in the United States. So join us today as we chat about the evolution of culinary apprenticeship, special skills chefs need to stand out today, and so much more. And there he is. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> hey, good morning, uh, Kirk. How are you? I'm so good. So good. Yes. And so just to set the stage for everybody, we, we haven't seen each other in a while, so it's really, really lovely to see you. And and Hello. you're you're on the West Coast. And I assume, I hope that the weather is treating you well. It's good. Good out here. Unfortunately, we had a lot of rain, which we, of course, need and love. And so things look look good for the uh, for the coming year. Very nice. And 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 tell us a little bit about what you see when you look out the window. There are there are there some olive trees, some avocado trees. Yeah, about uh, two hundred twenty olive trees, uh, <laughs> avocados, uh, peaches, uh, uh, dates, figs. Uh, you name it. It's it's all here. Herbs, of course, lots of herbs, and so. Uh, I, t I tell you honestly, for the first time, really, in uh, in my career, I'm uh, cooking with a lot of things that are grown right outside. Oh, isn't that something? That's that's it's, wonderful. Uh, wonderful, indeed. It's uh, a totally uh, uh, new experience, and I think it uh, speaks to the heart of what cooking is all about. Oh, yeah, well but, said, uh, well said. You yeah. know, it, it, it reminds me, you know, we, we chatted briefly yesterday, and I went to my library. I was one of the last times we saw each other when I was still living in Chicago. Um, you came to the house for dinner and it, it was so sweet. I don't know if you remember this, but you brought this, <laughs> you brought this, uh, this yeah. uh, book for my children and we still right. have it. And, uh, Good. and we, we made Roladen that day. We made Roladen with Spetsley and uh, braised right. cabbage right. and, and, you left uh, the spring on, and I left. I left the twine on the Roladen. <laughs> I'll never live it down. I I was telling my father about that. It's like, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? So, oh gosh, there's so much to talk about. But I I really, you know, first and foremost, congratulations. Um, I think this is your fourth book, but this this book, I'm not all the way through it yet. You can see that I've marked several pages. Um, it's heavy. It's 400. Um, from from many we are one uh I, I mean just a beautiful appropriate title um i i uh i i i wanted to read one little um quick piece here which was just so um so reminiscent of of what i went through uh mm -hmm. in in my life as well mm -hmm. small hotel bakery you know this expectation from <laughs> from from father right mm -hmm. um but I love you said, this is page 77, you said, the idea of family and the manner with which we all work together took much of the guesswork out of the many undefined issues. Mm -hmm. The most important to me, who takes over the family business? So yeah. can, can we just jump on there, right? Just quickly. Sure. And we're going to talk a lot more about the accolades and such, but tell me about growing up in a family business with a brother who is also... Um, uh, a master chef, you know, right. in right. Germany. Yeah. I think it was very challenging. Uh, but on the other hand, it uh, 
or supported by tradition. So when you have tradition, you don't question a lot of things because uh, a lot of things are already set in place. You just understand this is tradition and that's the way it is. Uh, having said that, uh, my brother being two years older and sort of two years ahead of me in both the apprenticeships and all these kind of things, uh, he did very well. He, um, uh, and uh, this of course follows uh, our father's um, I think we call it suggested mandate to take an apprenticeship. <laughs> and we understood what that meant, suggestive mandate, believe me. Um, so we both started an apprenticeship in um, uh, a cafe, the best cafe in Munich, where you learned, uh, uh, you know, all to make the cakes and, uh, and uh, the tarts and the chocolates and the whole thing. So that was a three-year experience. And then we went on to... Uh, 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 do a second apprenticeship in cooking at, okay. uh, at a newly opened hotel, which also is a big challenge uh, to open a hotel up. And um, so we became kind of rounded. And quite frankly, at the time, I didn't think it was a good idea to take yet another apprenticeship. But um, <laughs> uh, when um, I joined the uh, Culinary Institute, um, I could go into a bake shop or a kitchen and uh, feel very comfortable uh, talking about the curriculum, talking about uh, how we're doing things, what we're doing things. And uh, uh, I think that that was very, very important. Um, now, the only problem with my brother was that uh, he was very good in what he was doing and he finished uh, as the best apprentice in the state of Bavaria. Wow, uh, yeah. And so the expectations for me were to do the same, <laughs> which uh, fortunately I did, but I always was under a little bit more pressure to, to follow him. And uh, uh, he also did his master chef in Germany. And that kind of gave me the impetus to, to look at that program here in America. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, there's one important thing about um, the, uh, the apprenticeship, which took place in Munich, about uh, a good hour train ride away from where my parents had their hotel, butcher shop and uh, restaurant. So uh, every weekend we would come home and, um, you know, there you sit, everybody's busy around you and, you know, pretty soon you get involved, right? So every weekend, every weekend, which was to the detriment of our social life, sure, <laughs> I was just gonna say, <laughs> we uh, we made pastries and cakes and and here's the big thing, we were allowed to make mistakes, yeah. which is huge, huge. Sure. So when we uh, we didn't get punished for it, as opposed to the place in, in Munich, the apprenticeship, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, there was uh, there was a little punishment involved if you made a, a mistake, and that gave us so much confidence and so much we were so much ready uh, than some of our colleagues in the apprenticeship, um, and um, it, it just brought it all together and. Uh, so again, uh, I kind of try to follow that mantra into the uh, the curriculum of the CIA, hoping and allowing people to make mistakes because that's where you learn the most. It makes sense. So, so you mentioned that there was um, some encouragement, let's say, from your from your father. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so when you and Reinhold started yeah. the apprenticeship in Munich. Mm -hmm. was it, what with a specific goal in mind, I'm going to be pastry chef. I'm going to be cuisine chef. Or what did your father encourage you to learn everything about the business? It's everything because they also have a butcher shop. So we grew up uh, actually going with our grandfather out to the farmers to pick the calves and the pigs, take them, take them to the slaughterhouse, and uh, start uh, processing. Uh, uh, those animals uh, make sausages and all kinds of specialties. And along the way, you kind of begin to understand you, <laughs> there's no attachment to the animal. It can't be. Uh, it's always, always done on the, uh, with the recognition you are providing food for people. And sure. 
so we learned we learned uh, butchery just uh, by the mere fact that we were uh, in there in the butcher shop all the time. And was there a point, um, just specifically for you? Um, again, you're you're doing what your um, what your career path was supposed to be, but was there that moment where the inspiration actually came from you? Like, I this is what I am meant to do. Yeah, uh, but it wasn't one singular moment. I think it was uh, a progression and evolution because when you do something, you become very good at it compared sure. to contemporaries, uh, that confidence uh, tells you, hmm, maybe, maybe that's what I should be pursuing for the rest of my life. And uh, it, because it felt very comfortable. And, sure, uh, sure. and of course, then the, later on, um, brother had to take over the uh, business uh, because uh, he was two years older. That's just the way it was. Uh, I'm sure that's changed by now, but in those days, that's the way it went. And so I was free to go. And, and, and yeah, yeah, talk about that a little bit. And, and so you were free to go when, when, so you're, you're, you're in your, you're not even 20 years old, right? At this point. Right. right? And right. Reinhold right. knows that he's going to come back and take over the business. And I mean, was it an option for you to stay or was it like, Hey, there's only room for, for your <clears> brother <throat> and you know, you have to make your own way. Less than an option. It was an opportunity. Oh, better, better uh, word. Yeah. Yeah. The opportunity to see other cuisines, uh, visit other countries. And uh, in those days, I got my, I actually got a phone call uh, from a person I, I didn't know. And the individual said to me, do you want to come to America? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. But who are you? <laughs> he identified himself as being the general manager of the biggest hotel in New York, the Astro Hotel that served more banquets than any other place in America. Um, and um, so I got my and I said, well, how come you're calling me? He said, because I read in the paper this morning that you won the best apprenticeship in the state. And so I thought maybe uh, that's the right person. Uh, and um, in those days, within three weeks, I had my visa and uh, flew over uh, to what it was, what was called Idlewild Airport, now Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they picked me up and I started in the country club uh, because his friend was the general manager of the country club in New Jersey, um, which by itself was uh, an eye-opening experience because... And, and that kind of brought me back to to thinking about why don't that why is there not an apprenticeship? Um, my first day, I walked into the kitchen, uh, you know, properly dressed, as we as we know, uh, and um, they all laughed at me because they all had uh, you know t-shirts and sloppy and unkempt and uh, maybe not shaven. It, it was sort of the typical image of what the public had of a chef or cook in those days. You know, the t-shirt uh, uh, rolled up. Yeah. Rolled yeah. Up with yeah. a pack of uh, lucky <laughs> strike in there. <laughs> I mean, no, I, when I, when I hear you say the word opportunity, it brings me back, it, you know, my father, he came, he came to Chicago uh, versus New York and mm -hmm. a very similar story. And when I ask him, you know, what he remembers the most about that journey, he says opportunity. He couldn't believe the opportunity. Everywhere you turn, there was so much work and so much to do. Right. Uh, always busy. Right. Similar similar for you in New York, Chef? Yeah, no, very definitely. Uh, so the Country Club was a unique experience in that uh, I learned about what American food service was all about in, in, in many ways, but I also saw what tremendous opportunities uh, you have to improve that. Mm -hmm. And improve we did. Uh, Reinhold came over for half a year because he was already engaged and there was a, a nice break before he had to take over the business. And a friend of mine from Chicago also who did our apprenticeship together uh came and we kind of straightened out the kitchen 
and it made, <laughs> made a big difference. Uh, and uh, so uh, that that was the club. And then, of course, um, uh, the gentleman who brought me over, he said, whatever you do, doesn't matter. You have to work at Le Pavillon, which in those days was the best restaurant uh, in, in America. Uh, and uh, Pierre Fournay was the chef. Uh, who was then later on replaced by um, uh, Clément Granger. Uh, Jacques Pepin was one of the cooks there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was the only non-French person in the place. <laughs> and so uh, my, uh, my little um, knowledge of uh, French improved very rapidly, <laughs> by necessity, I would say. And I really consider uh, the three years I spent there as being pivotal to, it was like taking a new apprenticeship, pivotal to my career in terms of understanding quality, understanding uh, that there's no compromise to be made when it comes to quality. And the kind of cooking was just amazing. So I actually, um, I actually spent uh, more time there than, than I would, uh, than people would normally do, because I came in at ten o'clock in the morning, just to work with the poissonnier, the fish cook, and the entremetier and the uh, rotisseur, uh, just to learn what they are doing. And then uh, uh, from one o'clock uh, all the way down to ten o'clock was my shift, and I was first in charge of uh, the entremetier, making all the soups, the souffles, the vegetables, uh, all those kind of things. And um, it was uh, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, so much so that uh, um, yeah, I uh, became then Turna. Turna mm -hmm. is the person that replaces, uh, let's say, if, if one of the uh, cooks or chefs is on uh, uh, vacation or not able to come in, then uh, the Turna has to be able to go to the different stations of the kitchen to. Um, to uh, you know, uh, help out and to fill in. Uh, Clément Granger was the chef uh, who um, once was interviewed by um, a major magazine in New York. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember the editor. She spent more than uh, a whole week at Le Pavillon to do that article. And uh, later on, um, I, I read the article and. Uh, it was really funny because uh, Clément Granger, um, being the chef, he um, also wanted to know, uh, uh, tell the rest of the crew that he could still cook. Yeah? <laughs> and taking over the uh, uh, governorship position. In the tradition there was that, let's say, if an order of uh, Vio Scalopini was uh, placed, the uh, person in the, uh, on the medier would prepare the scallopinis and take them to the kitchen station. And I couldn't believe that uh, they uh, let the chef do that. <laughs> so I jumped in, right? I, uh, I helped him out. To that editor, he said, well, you know, we have all chefs, uh, French chefs in the kitchen, uh, except for one uh, fellow who is, uh, that's Fernand. He called me Fernand, um, who... Um, is better than any of the other French chefs. <laughs> the best. But um, yeah, uh, I think uh, to go to Le Pavillon from there, I went to, I wanted to see what hotel business was all about in uh, New York and went to the Plaza Hotel, a uh, great society hotel, uh, limited ballroom, limited facility. Why? So they wouldn't take the, um, you know, the fireman's uh, balls. Of sure, sure. People. So that was done by design. So they only catered to sort of the high society. Uh, I became banquet chef there. And sometimes I had over 20 functions in a day. You know, 500 people there, 200 there, 50 here, 25 there. And it was a tremendous experience uh, to, to work uh, in that kind of setting. I, I was going to ask about the plaza. I I, I was there uh, in January with the family, you know, to do the tea. Oh yeah. Um, and and I and <laughs> yeah. it, and it felt very. The pageantry is still there. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that I spoke with um, 
had been there for 25, 30 years, right? And that's that's really important to keep that sort of standard at a, at a certain level. Okay. Um, and, and, and I don't know when the last time you were there, but do you believe, Chef, that that is, it, is that limited to places just like the plaza or are there still some beautiful venues in the United States that still respect yeah. what it was like 50 years ago? Well, almost in any city, you'll find an iconic hotel that dates back to sure. that yeah. time period. Uh, and, um, you know, the Palmer house, uh, uh, comes to mind, uh, and um, uh, some of the other places, uh, because they have they have lived on that tradition and, and perpetuated that tradition. Um, I remember at the um, uh, as banquet chef, I only had one other assistant, and <laughs> you do all these things. So, what you you were forced to be on good terms with the big crew in the kitchen. Sure, right? yeah. And it, this was, <laughs> Yeah, I need that. And so uh, a couple of uh, bottles of beer went a long way to get things done. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, then, of course, I made a really big jump to go to the A.C. Heinz Company in Pittsburgh as experimental chef. I had no clue what that meant, <laughs> but I wanted, to under, I wanted to experience corporate America. And corporate America, it was, I mean, in many ways, totally different. But uh, I understood that um, in food research and development, and uh, later on, I managed the uh, department as a cook. Now, which is an interesting thing. I had PhDs working for me, scientists. <laughs> Why? Because uh, Heinz believed that at the very end, it's about flavor. <laughs> Not necessarily about chemistry, although they were both there. So I actually started out as a um, chemistry major in my undergraduate, and then finally realized, uh, uh, then I become an expert in two things, namely uh, uh, cooking and chemistry. And I said, that's that's not a good idea. And I switched to uh, business and finally got my uh, also my MBA at the university up in, in Pittsburgh. So uh, that was a very interesting and huge change for me uh, to go from Le Pavillon to and Plaza to go to a food manufacturer. But um, I, I learned a lot how you go about uh, developing uh, recipes, but also how you go about cooking in quantities, which is totally different than what, uh, what we are usually, uh, you know, if you have to make a cream sauce for, uh, let's say 700 gallons, huge. <laughs> That's a different that, way of doing it. And the but, flavor and the flavor has to be there. You know, right. I, I, w I was just going to insert one comment about Pittsburgh in mm. my experience there. Um, the, the, the cooks and the chefs of that city have such an profound respect for the craft of cooking. When it comes to the ACF, more chefs than not were members active members in the ACF. I remember Heinz, Heinz Lauer and I did a demo for right. you uh -huh. at a ACF conference there. I think we did Sauerbraten or, or, right. or something. It was a German dish, but right. you could always count on Pittsburgh to pack the house and highest level of certifications. Um, yeah. What, what, what do you think? Um, what, was it like that when you started in Pittsburgh as well? Well, I think what uh, what coalesced the uh, organization was uh, when we started to think about certification mm -hmm. in apprenticeship. Because, you know, like any organization, you need a purpose, you need a goal, you need something to, to keep the membership excited mm -hmm. and involved. And there was nothing better than, than that. Apprenticeship, we it became sort of we decided to do a hybrid model, a hybrid in the sense that uh, understanding that in America you should have a degree of some sort with great practical experience, and that's what we did. We we partnered with the local community college, had some great uh, cooperations there, and uh, what we did first we developed the program, 
implemented it locally in Pittsburgh and surrounding areas. And only after a few years did we take it publicly on okay. ACF wide. And the same for certification. Now, certification was a different challenge because up till now, anybody could put a uh, talk on and say, I'm a chef. That's the way it was, period. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, now you ask for qualifications, which is tough. Sure. And there are chefs in the Duquesne Club, who, which one of the outstanding private clubs in America. Um, and there are many clubs in Pittsburgh because at one time it was the it it was the home of more corporate headquarters than any other city in America. Alcoa, Westinghouse, US Steel, you know, all those kind of uh, places. So there were a lot of clubs and great, great clubs that people could, uh, you know, uh, be really challenged in their cooking. Uh, so in, in certification, having to now for the first time ever demand some qualification was a tough road. And uh, we bridged that by uh, uh, the leadership of, of the Pittsburgh chef would take the certification themselves. And those two programs coalesced the organization to a degree where they really felt proud of, where they felt involved, and where they also were the beneficiary. Because all of a sudden, you know, if you could say, I, I'm a certified executive chef or whatever, it was, you became uh, more noticed, you became more acclaimed, and oftentimes your salary was commensurate to, to that status. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted, I wanted to jump on that real quick. We talked about your role in establishing the chef's apprenticeship certification and then also the master chef certification. So we're, we're all the way back to the seventies and, and just to provide some added context, the ACF certified master chef is, is, is the only American master chef certification in the U S recognized by the department of labor. And it's, my understanding is that it's designed to identify chefs who've to your point, Chef, have demonstrated mastery of culinary competency and expertise through through through, through education, experience, knowledge, skills. I'm I'm curious how that got started and how that has advanced over the years. It's probably a whole nother podcast, but just at a high level, right. you went from identifying or recognizing industry professionals with certifications. And then it moved to this this high level, which was very similar to what you were used to in Europe, right? It's basically again a hybrid model, combining uh, uh, American ideas and uh, criteria and uh, European uh, uh, methods. And uh, yeah, uh, I was sort of um, when I started the program. Um, because my brother had a uh, had a master chef uh, degree from Germany, and uh, I was thinking maybe I need to go over there and take that examination, uh, which unfortunately uh, would take six weeks to be away from your job. Uh, in America, that wouldn't fly. Period. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what we did was uh, we developed the program uh, based on. The, uh, the European model and was fortunate because my father and uh, brother, both master chefs, uh, I could uh, understand how they are doing it, what the methods and the procedures were. And so we, we prepared, we uh, uh, created that hybrid model and with the idea that it really, uh, when you, when you graduate from that, you're really a complete professional. And um, I think the, uh, the result of which was uh, also commensurate with, with that goal. And uh, as a result, the program uh, has grown, but not to the degree that we had hoped. Not okay. It, uh, it was a, at one time, it was a 10 year, a 10 day program. Mm -hmm. Every day you come in in the morning, like seven o'clock to 10 o'clock, there was a uh, theoretical subject, uh, whether it be purchasing or uh, food to sanitation or whatever. And then from about uh, 11 till 7 in the evening, it was, you, have, you were assigned a cooking task. 
and it could have been anything. You, you, you drew a, a number out of a hat and it told you what the assignment was. Um, and that requires really uh, individuals to think very fast. Um, you couldn't, you didn't even have time to consult a recipe book or a cookbook or whatever. You don't have time. So the moment you get that assignment, you have to jump on it because of the timing, etc. And that really also, that kind of additional pressure is what we, what chefs experience uh, all the time. And so uh, I think uh, it became, uh, uh, the program changed, uh, I think now it's five days allowing, uh, or six days, allowing people to uh, brush up on, uh, especially the theory uh, uh, subjects, the theoretical ones, uh, and complete them. Uh, so by the time they go into the practical, they already, they only have to focus on that. Uh, they're the base, whether that's good or bad, uh, but, uh, it is what it is. So, uh, yeah, the program has not, and and through AMCO, we are trying to uh, to uh, make them more accessible, without which is really a key, without compromising the standards. Mm -hmm. I w I was told once that when you arrive for the ten days, the original ten days of the certified Master Chef exam, you're not there to learn. You're there to demonstrate your cooking ability and your knowledge and um yeah. how how important is this is kind of a you know just a general question very theoretical how important is it in your mind chef for chefs um who respect the craft to put themselves i know how my father my, my father received the you know the german master chef as well and when he talked about it it i mean there was never a doubt in his mind that that's what he was going to do, to, to challenge himself to the highest level and then come to America. Yeah. Is, is is that missing today with chefs? Well, it's different now. Uh, chefs understand that uh, that title would uh, allow them to, to not only prove to themselves, but to their crew and to their uh, uh, management staff that uh, they have, uh, you know, put themselves in a position where they really can uh, understand uh, and be a complete cook in many ways. Um, so that part has not changed. Uh, but I, I think uh, there is a, a general feeling that all, you can study for the program. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, that goes back to my original exactly. understanding, right? It's, it's once you're there, you uh, you have to put in place what you know, and it's all about your passion of cooking, your understanding that less is more. And by the way, that phrase "less is more" re is repeated in my book about fifty times. <laughs> but I, I thoroughly believe in it. I, I I think it's just such an important thing. To understand when not to interfere with nature. Take a take a wonderful uh, New Jersey uh, beefsteak tomato that at its best, ripest, bursting with flavor. As a cook, you shouldn't do anything to it. Maybe yeah. sprinkle <laughs> a little olive oil and salt, and that's it. Leave it alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you can't improve it. But this requires an understanding and confidence on behalf of the cook to do that. Because many cooks say, oh, then I cannot show my expertise. I cannot show, okay, so you show your creativity, you show your expertise and you screw it all up. You change <laughs> what nature has provided. And I think it takes a seasoned and experienced and confident cook to get to that point. No, very, very, very well said. Perfect segue into talking a little bit about culinary competitions. You, you've been involved with competition for a very, very, very long time, namely the U.S. Olympic team. 
Could you talk a little bit about your experience, particularly a lot of people that hear about the Culinary Olympics don't even realize that there is a Culinary Olympics every four yeah. years. But yeah. I'd, I'd love for you to speak a little bit about what it's like and what it takes to compete on a global stage. And, and even competing before the Culinary Olympics, there's competitions across the country all the time, sure. right? How important is that for us? I think it's, as long as you think it's a learning experience, it's very important. If you think about medals, forget it. Mm -hmm. Then you become mm -hmm. what I call a competition cook. And a competition cook cooks only for the appearance and, uh, you know, making one plate, they never think about, oh, but maybe I have to make a hundred plates like that. And I couldn't do it the way I do it for a competition. So you have to get rid of that mindset and you have to understand that uh, it is only, it only works if you can do it in a larger setting and uh, uh, get away from the idea that you cook for competition, you cook for a customer no matter what, even if the food is not going to be consumed, but it has to look like that, he has to feel like that, has to have the aroma, has to have everything that uh, that uh, uh, you would do in a, in a restaurant. And um, so uh, in the uh, Olympics, and in my book, I have a section that says, that talks about how to develop your own food philosophy. And I think that's crucial because um, the food philosophy is something that gives you guidance, that gives you uh, something to lean on. And I, when I came to the CIA, I had developed a, a fair amount of that philosophy, realizing that's an ongoing, changing element. It's never going to be static. It always will change because you have different experiences. But the challenge there was, how do I intertwine my personal food philosophy with that, it, the existing one at the CIA? Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. And the only way we could overcome that is uh, to, uh, to basically listen to a lot of people and understanding and out of that, formed an institutional philosophy on cooking. Uh, give you an example. Just to talk about bechamel in our um, you know, uh, books that we wrote. We spent a whole day arguing, debating, discussing how to make bechamel sauce because we had instructions from 20 different countries around the world, different ideas, different methods, different this, and, but out of that came a fundamental recognition that 80% of what we do needs to be consistent for the student, so they're not confused. 20% can be the individual input of the instructor, of their experience in the past and uh, whatever they felt was uh, going to enhance that process. And so, uh, again, uh, that same philosophy carried on with the, uh, with the teams that I, wa I was involved with over 20 years with uh, culinary teams. And, uh, you know, in 1976, which was such an incredible year for American food and wine, at the uh, 76 uh, tasting in Paris, wines, uh, from Chateau Montelena, the Chardonnay and uh, and the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, and, uh, yeah, the Cabernet Sauvignon won over the French best uh, Grand Cru uh, varietals. Unheard of, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and French um, uh, writer uh, Odette Kahn, from um, who was in the head of the uh, French wine board. She demanded to have her score sheet back <laughs> <laughs> because uh, she could believe, you know, what what the scores were. In '76, the same time we entered the Culinary Olympics, we were basically a nobody. But on the team in '68, we did okay, uh, and then in '68, we started to understand what it is that we needed to do, mm -hmm. and. Um, so here we were, we, um, 
also as part of that experience, we were invited by the State Department to cook a luncheon for the Queen of England in Boston during the bicentennial. And um, that was by itself a unique experience because uh, we were told that uh, after uh, the luncheon, uh, the, the team should line up and if the Queen wants to say hello, she will, she will do such that. And uh, so here they were. They came out of the uh, um, of the dining room, and the uh, queen made a beeline towards us. And the mayor of Boston, uh, Kevin White, at the time, put his hand on her shoulder. <laughs> but you don't do. you're just a good experience. <laughs> the CIA and the British Secret Service were all over the place. On top, yeah. Oh my gosh. She <laughs> shunned them away. She took charge, and she gave him an ice cold look that could have killed, I think. <laughs> and in spite of that went straight to us. She so, wanted to talk to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So everybody's hand and uh, so that was a unique experience. But going back to the Olympics in seventy six, we had a team philosophy. Uh and we carried that through and we, we decided to cook dishes that uh, people could replicate in uh, restaurants throughout America. Um, so at the awards presentation, um, the announcer said, uh, and for the first time they had first, second, and third podiums like they have in the Olympics, right? Sports Olympics. And uh, so they said, well, uh, we could, um, uh, we like the American team that came in third. And we like the American team to come to the podium, which for us was unbelievable, right? Wow, yeah, Ever. yeah. And then he said, oh, uh, excuse me, we made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> American team tied the French team for third, which I thought was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> better than being being up there on your own, right? And oh, that, my God. Monumental, yeah. And yeah. the problem was the... Uh, Podium was designed for six chefs. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of uh, this going on, a lot of elbows to to maintain your spot up there. But uh, that was a monumental experience for us, and uh, and really that that's why I say seventies, the decades of the seventies were so instrumental. Apprenticeship came about, certification came about, Master Chef was started, the Olympics, the uh, Paris tasting. All these things brought a tremendous amount of excitement and confidence, saying that America can compete and can be uh, right up there with anybody else. And and you had so much to do with that. And it 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 brings me to a you know some personal feelings. I'm I'm so amazed um, by all of the awards and the accolades over the years and the milestones that you're personally responsible for. Yeah. Uh, chef and and I think about myself, you know, growing up in a, you know, in a in a baker's family and a hotel family, yeah. and I've been involved with culinary education for thirty years now, and and I have a lot to thank you for, because in addition to all those things that you were working on, you had the foresight to bring a level of degree to the CIA back before anyone was thinking about that, you know, you go to culinary school and actually earn an associate's degree with transferable credit by a, a regional accreditor and then a bachelor's degree and so on and so forth. So, so first and foremost, um, I, I, I wanted to thank you for that. You, you know, take, take advantage of this time together and have you kind of talk about what, what, what was going on in your mind that you were thinking we need to elevate the educational levels of those who are studying our craft? It, I mean, brilliant, really. Yeah. Uh, again, it, it was viewed as an opportunity to do that. And when you're the head of an organization, you have a lot of influence. How this, yes, you how do. Yes, you do. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, so as a result, we, we focused a lot on uh, the culinary aspects. 
not to neglect the others, but uh, the culinary is what we were, what we were all about. And so, uh, you know, we we put uh, when we hired an instructor. Uh, before that person was hired, they had to cook a three course meal for the other department heads and um, within a time frame uh, from a mystery basket, uh, because that tells you more than any resume or anything else that you need to know. And the real uh, question that always arose, and I uh, uh, staunchly defended that uh, when people said, well, you cannot make a uh, a um, uh, good chef into an instructor uh, is, uh, and I said, wait a minute, what do you rather do? Take a mediocre chef and uh, or make, take a mediocre chef and make a good chef of, of that person or take a, uh, a uh, experienced chef and make a um, uh, instructor. And I said, I do, I, I always follow the latter and uh, as a result, I hired my former boss at the plaza, uh, Chef uh, Andre René, as an instructor. I hired, was happy to hire uh, chefs in their 50s and 60s, kind of a little bit burned out by the demands of the industry, mm -hmm. would give me another 10 years of incredible experience. Uh, something which you just cannot pay for. And uh, stories, stories that, that you cannot. Yeah. So, uh, uh, that became uh, you know, a, a really uh, uh, standout point because, uh, you know, not only were they very seasoned, but they also, for the first time in their lives, had a life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were home at night. Yeah, yeah. Both yeah. weekends and holidays and what have you. But they also began to realize they can form their own legacy, mm -hmm. by, which you know uh, as much as anybody. Uh, when you're in teaching, it's uh, it's not your salary, it's not your reputation, it's your legacy of having had an impact on so many lives of different students, which you just cannot uh, replicate anywhere else. So, so well said. And to that point, I... I wanted to read a quote. This is from Stephen Michaelitis, former editor in chief, associate publisher at, at right. Restaurant Hospitality Magazine. He right. says, and I quote, aside from Ferdinand Metz, there is no other person in America who has witnessed, supported, and actively influenced the evolution of American cuisine while stewarding for 21 years the fortunes of the Culinary Institute of America, the country's most influential culinary college. I I, I wanted to ask you know, what a wonderful time and, you know, 30,000 plus students that, it, that came across that podium. Yeah. How, how, I know how it makes me feel. I, yeah. I'd love to hear how that makes you feel. You know, in 21 years, there was not one time when I walked into the, and I usually must have fairly, fairly early seven o'clock. I walked in, the classes already were in session, the morning classes. I always, always felt a sense of excitement, a sense of presence, a sense of uh, um, uh, passion for for the school when I walked in. And uh, uh, I think the same uh, carried forward um, when uh, you start uh, to think about your the curriculum that you want to institute and the standards that you're you're trying to set uh, but it always felt like a very special place and it goes right back to this uh, comment of yours about the legacy of uh, seeing that many students uh, uh, come across the stage to successfully accept their uh, diploma and go on to the world. And quite frankly, they made a huge difference. Uh, culinary schools really as a, uh, as a whole contributed so much to the uh, quality of food in America today, uh, which you only understand if you understand what happened in the past, which was sure. not always, uh, the very best. But, um, you know, that part uh, really, uh, 
graduations, although I attended over 250 graduations. <laughs> It never became, oh my God, another one. Oh, it always was felt special. Yeah. Always felt yeah. special because you look in those, the eyes of those people that graduate, hopeful, excited, passionate. You knew that many of them would really fulfill their uh, dream of becoming a, uh, a good chef uh, or a restaurant owner or uh, somehow successful in the industry. Yeah, so well said. So well said, Chef. By the way, Steve, uh, I just visited. Uh, we have a little place down in Mexico, uh, Puerto Vallarta, and Steve has moved down there. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I visited him. I gave him a copy of the book, and uh, yeah. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Well, well, let's let's talk about the book. I've got it. I've got it right here. You released uh, your latest book. Uh, I think your fourth book. Um, yeah, yeah. From from many we are one, which reveals uh, nev the never before told story, right? And rebirth, yeah. like we've been talking about today, and globalization of American cuisine, right. uh, influenced by iconic restaurants, shaped by passionate individuals like yourself, and enriched by education. Right. There, there was as I was preparing to chat with you, I. I uh, read an Amazon reviewers, and, mm. and and that person said, and I quote: "I was fortunate to see Chef Metz cook several times, and his meticulous pursuit of quality is truly inspiring. The book perfectly exemplifies his solid work. In my interactions with him, he always was a wonderful mentor, inspiring us, and his actions and his and, and his advice. I I want to ask about what inspired you." to write the book and what readers can expect. But I do want to, I want to set it up. His quote is so, um, so perfect, right? When I think about Ferdinand Metz, you and I were standing, this is years ago, you and I were standing around a group of students. You may not even remember it because it was so casual and so informal. They were all just kind of asking some questions. And you said, if I gave you sugar and eggs and milk, what would you make? And, and it was so simple, yet the students, you know, they thought they, you know, they thought it was a trick or something, right? And then you talked about ice cream and then the yeah. smiles and, you know, the simplicity with which you have been able to deliver education and inspiring through your actions. I'd, I'd love for you to um, talk talk about what inspired these 400 pages <laughs> and, and, and I've got notes all over the place. I'm not through it yet, but right. you know, congratulations. First of all, just, just Thank wonderful. You. Yeah. First of all, the title really uh, explains that American cooking wasn't born in the absence of any other influence. I mean, it's the influence of every ethnic group that ever came to our shores and the, uh, and started to cook their home uh, homegrown meals and uh, share them with Americans, and uh, uh, that's that's really the title. Now, the book kind of evolved; it became bigger by the minute, so to speak. Because yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're excited about doing something, you say, "Well, I want to write about this. I want to write about that." And um, quite frankly, uh, I had to admit to myself that the book is basically a broad overview. Let's say if a, a student needs to know what the history of American cooking is all about, but not having to read 10 books to do that, this will do it because it kind of capsulates important events, important stages on the, uh, during the evolution uh, and to show how all that happened and what it means for us today. So every, almost every chapter in this book could have its own book written. Sure, sure. But again, I wanted to cover a whole base of, uh, of different things. And uh, uh, so the book became bigger by the minute, more or less. Um, you know, I wanted to add uh, a debate about new techniques, you know, what what does molecular cooking mean to us? Uh, uh, nouvelle cuisine, fusion cuisine, and I blended that with some of the historical elements of that cuisine and today's application. Um, I also wanted to raise some 
social concerns, you know, like uh, what happened to the women in our industry? Why was the media so inconspicuously absent in recognizing the uh, value of women chefs in America? I mean, it's amazing. Usually the, the media, they want to jump on every new uh, story they can. They didn't do that. Why? And I talked to a lot of women chefs and a lot of our women chef graduates from the school. And, uh, uh, you know, that came to the foreground. So I wanted to cover that. And I wanted to, uh, and I essentially finished up by saying, you know what happened to the American suck, women's soccer and hockey teams? They rose from obscurity to world powers. Now, why? Because Title IX. Title IX demanded that every college would provide equal number of spaces for female athletes as for male, male athletes, scholarships, opportunities. And that's and then I said, maybe it's time the food service industry invokes our own Title IX uh, in order to highlight uh, uh, the contribution of women. And the same social concern uh, was covered by talking about African-American chefs, you know, their contributions to cuisine uh, and um, their legacy and uh, i think it was just an important thing to highlight not to glance over but to really devote some you know several pages to to those issues and uh, let people know that uh, these are issues that we are concerned with and we should really understand them and uh, but there is some good news because as you know at culinary schools, a major proportion is now female chefs, female students. Sure. And they have learned, and the male students have learned to work together with them. So I am very hopeful that in the future, uh, this whole issue of male, female and the male dominance and all this kind of stuff will disappear because uh, they have already uh, worked uh, alongside each other. Uh, the same thing uh, I'm uh, hoping to see happen with uh, African American chefs. Now we have seen uh, most recently a great influx of new uh, chef, uh, black chefs that have uh, made the headlines and have done some great things. And so uh, it's important for our industry, just as simple as that, to recognize that and to f promote that. Along those lines, chef, what what uh, what's next? For cooking in America, what 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 do the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years look like in your mind? I think that uh, we have settled in uh, and understand that it's not just only about great cooking, as it was, you know, developed during the 70s, 80s and 90s. But now it's to take that and to make a business of it, a good business. <laughs> and to be customer focused and for that reason i devoted a whole section in the book on uh, hospitality and on um, uh, all kinds of uh, issues that today have an array uh, because people have not paid attention to those uh, i have a comical section in the book that talks about the experience of going to a restaurant today where, um, where the two uh, people at the front desk talk about their weekend plans and you should stand there and uh, hope to get a word in, you know, to get seated. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then you, go to the, you get to the table and somebody throws you the menu like a Frisbee and says, <laughs> Joe will take care of you. Wow, no kidding, Joe will. <laughs> Joe comes around and... Uh, you know, does his thing and gives you the litany and uh, of the new dishes and the uh, and the origin where the chicken came from, which all is not important. For <laughs> and, uh, uh, so um, and then uh, Joe comes around and he has at a table for two, as an example, he has the dishes, right? And he comes and stops at your table and waits. And what he's waiting for is that you 
the customer cleared the paraphernalia <laughs> from the table. So Make I, room for the plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh then he has a table for two. He asks, who gets the fish? The table for two. So, so yeah, the book talks about uh, some of those issues too, because I think they are important. And I think this is part of what the settling in period is that we are have have uh, started now and I think that will carry on to the future namely to take all the good things that we learned and, and combine them with hospitality and speaking of hospitality the, there's another certification issue which asks why don't we have professional waiters they have not, no organization like ACF to lean on they have no educational opportunities, basically. Sure, in your school and ours, uh, they worked in the dining room and have more of an idea what to do than most other raiders. Mm -hmm. They are very friendly, which is great, uh, but, um, you know, and they don't have to be classically trained, but they have to understand hospitality. And the reason why they, uh, have not progressed to a professional status is because there's no certification and no organization to back them up and to promote them and to advocate for for uh, their goals. And so uh, I, I think in this settling in period, blending our skills with a, with a great sense of hospitality and business acumen is going to be the successful formula. Absolutely great advice. I, I was going to ask, you know, what's next for culinarians today in front of the house, back of the house. Um, I can't believe that we've gotten to the end of our hour. I, I do have another question or two for you, if you can stay with me. Sure. But before before I get to our last question, um, what's next for Ferdinand Metz? Is there a is there another book in the works? Is there? <laughs> uh... I'm kind of thinking about uh, uh, doing another book of um, uh, vegan uh, dishes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. The yeah. Why I do that. Uh, um, my wife and I, we were challenged by our daughter to, who is vegan to say, um, uh, she challenged us to be on a vegan diet for a whole week. And okay. Uh, we did that more than that. We we did it for almost uh, three quarters of a year. Okay. Uh, and I learned a lot about that. I okay. learned an awful lot about how to develop flavors without the meat protein, without the uh, drippings uh, of the uh, meat roast that usually Shh. results in that great flavor. Uh, I learned that you needed to really understand cooking a little bit more because now you have to uh, understand where to where do I get the flavors from? You know, is it the lemon zest? Is it uh, is it uh, a certain spice? Is it? Uh, and I think in that process, cooking techniques become so much more important. Now, back in the back in the sixties, if you wanted a vegetable plate, if you were one of those real weird people. <laughs> who wanted to have a vegetarian play. The chef would simply take, well, okay, we have a broiled tomato that uh, was with the meat dish. Okay, put a broiled tomato, or we have some string beans out of the, uh, <laughs> that's another thing, out of the steam table, you put that on. You know, we have uh, a little broccoli, and that was it. Today, you- Out cook, it went, yeah, yeah. Right? You cook <laughs> a, a vegetarian plate. And so I was very intrigued because I think it challenged me to understand better, understand more uh, about what, what cooking can be and should be all about, because now you have to look for flavor developments through essences, through reductions, through uh, special seasonings, uh, that we in the in the presence of meats not always have to do because meat carries the plate of the uh, center plate of the dish carries the dish in many ways. I'm I'm so happy to hear that. My my family does much on the plant based uh, uh, diet. Did you feel better a little bit noticeably? I think so. I think so. Yeah. 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 Uh, we uh, you know, uh, but we are discretionary vegans. We yeah. are vegans. <laughs> <laughs> because I never want to, uh, you know, say, oh, 
I cannot have a piece of meat if I want to. Yes, I can. Sure, or, sure. Or yeah. Chicken or, or whatever. We are very discretionary in what how we how we select our menus and we don't deny ourselves anything. Why should we? But yeah. uh, I always have to say that we are paying so much more attention to not only cooking, but buying the right kind of ingredients. I mean, yeah. cooks need to understand that. You, you're not going to make a great dish with dish, with uh, ingredients that are inferior. You're just not going to do it. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. why don't you do yourself a favor and pay more <laughs> attention to the purchasing, to buying the best quality? You know, when it comes to uh, delivery of ingredients, uh, as an example, the word will get around which chef really has somebody there to control to reject certain uh, items because they were not up to standards that goes around and the chef who doesn't gets whatever is left that goes around too <laughs> so, it's so. a perfect segue into chef the name of our our little chat is the ultimate dish so given given what we just wow. talked about in your mind what is the ultimate dish <laughs> well, that's an easy question to answer because uh, we just did that the other day. We had we had some um, uh, friends over, uh, seven people or nine people, whatever, and I made the dish that I uh, like probably the most, and that's braised oxtails. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I I just. Uh, the flavor that uh, you can develop with uh, in the sauce itself, the tenderness of the meat interspersed with a little bit of fat. So it's very tender, very juicy. Sure, it takes a long time to cook. It takes understanding how you do that. Yeah. But the dish itself is just incredible. Paired, uh, paired with what wine? Uh, Spätzle, you know. It, uh, and <laughs> Or, or or a com in in our case last time we we had a combination of sweet and regular mashed potatoes uh, combined you know yeah 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 uh, 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 yeah um, uh, 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 Brussels sprouts but not charred <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, these days uh, very simple but you know the flavors just are incredible. Per so, perfect ultimate dish and and a and a beautiful cabernet to go along with it uh beer beer okay <laughs> yeah. perfect in that case in that case we had some beer now let me make a, a quick more comment uh when you look at the book uh what's very strange is is since there are no testimonials in here on the back page right uh-huh well, for some reason that didn't get in there, and I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but we had, had over 20 testimonials, and they will be featured in the new book, which okay. is a reprinted book um, from, you know, uh, uh, Thomas Keller, Jasper White, uh, from uh, Sarah Moulton, from uh, Drew Nipuron, the restaurant owners. Uh, uh chefs you know uh and it just was incredible that uh that didn't make uh, the first edition of the book but uh that will be uh that will be corrected and uh hopefully that uh, will work out uh, uh much better and and i will await my copy of the updated i appreciate yeah. that <laughs> it's, it's, uh, hopefully it'll get done real soon but uh yeah, so things things are good. Uh, uh, if anybody wants some advice about writing a book, be prepared. Uh, you know, and it's not a cookbook; it's a book about cooking, but not a cookbook. Yeah, absolutely. But be prepared that for the fact that writing is easy, getting it done from that point on is a hard part. It's another story. Yeah, it's a totally other story. Totally other because. Well, you're venturing into you're venturing into areas that are not familiar to you publishing you know, sure etc etc et so how, how long did it did the process take from beginning to end writing about two years okay 
uh, and of course, then the pandemic became it came in between. All the publishing houses in New York were shut down for the that time period, uh, which was not all the way all bad because, contrary to some advice I got, which says once you write it, don't go back to it. I did. <laughs> I did go back. To you it. went back. Yeah. Yeah. I went back because you have another idea and you say, oh, I need to clarify this point. Or I want to add another segment to it uh, like that, um, uh, how to develop your own food philosophy and the hospitality aspect, uh, as well as some uh, interesting stories about uh, uh, chefs that uh, that we interacted uh, throughout our careers. And so that you really, um, I think it made the book better, uh, but it took a longer time. Yeah. Well, it, this has been such a pleasure and an honor for me to, to spend some time with you. Congratulations on all the success, Chef. And, and, and let's stay in touch. Let's stay in touch. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. And uh, uh, yeah, we'd like to, are you going to be at the convention? Yeah, yeah, this year. and. Yeah. And yeah. um and that reminds me too when the when the when you press that first uh, harvest of olives I, I want to know all about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are uh, we are hopeful. We are hopeful. They have uh, some olives for oil and others for uh, you know be salted. Sure, you know, sure, prepare. yeah. So it's it's good. We'll 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 learn a lot. Like it, you know, <laughs> learning is a process that uh, doesn't end. And I think. Uh, that holds true for any kind of certification master chef i always tell uh, people that's not the end for god's sake this is a beginning maybe we're just getting more started of a, more of a tool <laughs> to learn more so. thank you for listening to the ultimate dish podcast brought to you by Auguste escoffier school of culinary arts visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast including notes links and other resources you can also browse other episodes and subscribe.